You have death to face. You have illness to face. You have pain to face. These direct experiences that you're having are universal to all creatures. And each and every one of us has to think about these, the, 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 these experiences on an existential level. And it's not about how we conceptualize doctrines. And this is what, what you, was, was something that I was emphasizing in Bob Siegel. It's not about us conceptualizing doctrines or accepting doctrines within our mind. That, okay, God is a trinity. Or that, or that angels exist, or that there's a heaven and a hell, and this is what it might look like. These are doctrines in mental gymnastics that any of us could do. They don't really matter. And th what really matters is our <laughs> spiritual growth in the world. And this is why I distinguish spirituality from religiosity. Religion is a belief system. Religion is what I believe to be true about what happens to us when we die, or what God wants from us. But spirituality is, again, what is it? It's the direct experience of life. It's our growth as we, as we go through life. And this is why I acknowledge myself as a spiritual person and not a religious person anymore. I was a religious person. I had to do these rituals. I had to pray five times a day. And if I didn't pray five times a day, I thought God was mad at me. If I, didn't, if I interpreted something wrong... I thought God would be upset at me because I didn't have the right hermeneutics or interpretations about his religion. And what a, what, what a naive way of looking at divinity and reality. So there, there's other aspects to this, but, but primarily what I want to, to say is universalism says that we all experience love, we all experience compassion, we all experience God. <laughs> And each and every one of us should be in pursuit of that source of our existence. And when we are, we become a vessel for God. We become a vessel for love and compassion and growth and understanding. So that when we touch the lives of other people, and we bring about love and compassion in them, that is what life is teaching us. And all of those scriptures of the, uh, 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 and religions of the world have these teachings ingrained in them. Because all of us, historically, from time immemorial, recognize the power of love, compassion, and reaching out. We went through racism. We went through segregation. We went through slavery. And we learned from those experiences. Each and every one of us has gone through, through being punished by our parents, has gone through crimes that we've committed, sins that we've, that, that we've committed. We're learning and growing from these things. These things are practical, they're real, they're not just beliefs inside of our minds, and they're universal to each and every human being. And so what universalism looks at is that every human being has to go through the journey. It's not about what they come to believe about reality, it's about how they live their lives. How their experiences are helping them grow. We can believe a lot of things. I believe a lot of things. But it's not about beliefs. It's about my relationship with God. A relationship that I believe is very real. A relationship that I had with God when I was a Muslim still. When I was a Muslim, I had a relationship with God, and that relationship was real. And that relationship has never changed, even after I left Islam. Because it wasn't about my beliefs or conceptualizations, or mental gymnastics, or my efforts to figure out life's mysteries. It was something more than that. When I go to work every day at Johns Hopkins, I see some of the most intense suffering. People who are cutting themselves, who people who want to kill themselves, people who are going through overdose, putting medicine in their body because they can't take the pressures of peer pressure and judgment of other people. People are hearing voices because they were sexually traumatized when they were children. God created this for a reason. And it's not for a belief system <coughs> that he wants you to accept within your mind. It's for growth. And this is what all of the religions of the world have taught us. I've went through every single religion, not just studying them in books. I've gone to the churches. I've gone to mosques. I've gone to Hindu temples. And I see everybody struggling to reach God. The, the message of, of Christianity is special to me, especially the crucifixion of Jesus. 
on a symbolic, metaphorical level. Because when I, when I think about a man who was crucified, it reminds me of us who are suffering. Each and every one of us is crucified, suffering. Praying, dear God, take this cup away from me. Sometimes feeling, because life is so hard. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We each and every one of us goes through that in our suffering. Why me? Why do I have to go through this? Why do we have to go through this? Each and every one of us is crucified right now. But the hope that the Bible gives, not my will, but your will as it is in heaven, because that will in, 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 as it is in heaven has, says that there's hope on the other side. That there's a reason and purpose for this, and it's to help us grow and understand one another. And I think that it's universal to anyone and everyone who is seeking God. And I pray that each and every one of us can come to accept that and not try to take God away from anybody else who doesn't believe what you believe. To think that because I don't believe what you believe, that I deserve to go to hell for eternity, just doesn't do justice to what life is. Hell is described as a place of torment, gnashing of teeth, misery, darkness, forever and ever. It never ends. Torment. So the suffering that's going on in this world, the evil that you see in this world, you talk about Adolf Hitler's Osama bin Laden's, you'll be getting tortured forever. This is what I was taught with Islam. Muslims used to tell me that people, are, their skins are going to be burned off and replaced with new skin endlessly. Because they didn't accept beliefs. And I couldn't possibly believe that. When I experienced diversity and plurality in the United States of America, I fell in love with it. And I couldn't face diversity and plurality. Everyone trying to do what they could do within the best of their capacity to, 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 to do what they could with life. And if they found room for improvements, they should pursue those improvements. And if they don't, there's consequences. This is what life teaches us. This is what the journey is about. And that's time. And now Mr. Weinhardt will give his 20 minute opening statement. Tonight's debate is uh, basically the impossible debate. And the reason why is that when you take a position of ignorance, which is what an agnostic is, they don't know or claim not to know. And then they debate a position that presupposes knowledge on a subject, the debate's already won. So the moment that Farhan accepted this debate, he lost. And part of my job here tonight is going to be to show you why, if it hasn't been evident already. That the, the person that claims ignorance is in a lesser, inferior position than the person that claims to know, if that can be proven. So for Han, from a position of ignorance, wants to pontificate on things he claims he's ignorant of. It's a big contradiction. So this debate is very, uh, it's a dichotomy. It shouldn't be happening. So why did I accept the debate? Well, because it gives me an opportunity with a universalist to demolish every conceivable worldview that has, has ever risen in the heart of man contrary to the truth that God has revealed. So tonight I will level every single worldview that has ever surfaced since the beginning of time to today. And anything to the, from this point forward, because truth is incontrovertible. Otherwise, by definition, it is not truth. So it is, the question is this, concerning uh, John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus being the way, the truth, and the life. We have to ask certain things of Farhan, first of all, and those things are going to be, does he even believe the verse in Scripture to be truth? Propositional truth, revelation from our Creator, who is a personal cognitive ego that has spoken to us and given us revelation of himself, of his son, of his will, as a matter of fact. 
or is it just arbitrary or subjective based on somebody's experience that simply got carried on by others and there's no real validity to it behind it. So we're going to take a look at that and from the slides that I'm going to present, they might be a little bit scattered but I'll try to work through them. If you look there, those are just a few of the world religions that we're going to be dealing with. These are just some of the books. I, didn't ha I don't have a truck or I would have brought my library. These are books that I've read from cover to cover concerning world religions to see if they are true, to see if the claims they make are valid, if they are supported by reality, by the facts. Tonight's question concerning Jesus in John 14, 6 is, is he the way or is he one of many ways? One of the things I do in my personal ministry is do open air preaching. I go out to the streets of Santa Monica and I engage people in debate publicly. I set up a public uh, forum, a microphone, speakers. I use, bring some of my books. And I ask people to step forward to the microphone and ask any question they want, present any worldview they like. It doesn't matter how emotional they get. It doesn't matter how angry they get. As long as their arguments are not led by emotions. Life is an emotional roller coaster. World views are going to bring you up and down. There are things we like, things we don't like, things we're indifferent about, but nonetheless, the truth cannot be governed or judged or ruled or dismissed or established by your emotional subjective feelings. That is not how judges rule in courtrooms. Just because the judge feels like it. That's not a good judge, although some do that. We recognize that as being a poor judge. 1 Peter 3.15 in the Bible tells us to sanctify, and this is the Christians, so I don't expect the non-Christians to follow this, to sanctify the Lord God in our hearts and to be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh of you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and with fear. This does not mean that we do it like sheep. It means we do it respectfully, in a valid way, with fear and trembling before God that we are presenting truths that are reflecting the Creator of heaven and earth who is righteous. And so when we present these facts, these evidences, these proofs, these arguments, we do them as ambassadors for the kingdom of God. So we don't shrink back. We go forward boldly, and I have to admit, sometimes not so respectfully. But you got to understand, the world does not respect God. Don't be led astray by Farhan's niceness. He's a nice guy. But as somebody said, the way to hell is paved with good intentions. Your goodness or your kindness, horizontally speaking, before men, doesn't carry any weight with God. You don't, God will not judge us based on how we stood up next to our fellow man. He's going to judge us by His righteous standard that is universal. If you want universalism, the righteousness of God is universal. And no pygmy in the forest and no academic in the university is going to be without excuse on that day of judgment. Because God has given us all a conscience to know right from wrong. And that is enough, God says, to hold them accountable and be judged and sent straight to hell. 